Hello everyone, this is uh, the voice of Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau for a second here introducing uh, today again Grandmaster Sam Shanklin of the U.S. Um, tomorrow Sam will join me and a couple other Americans in battling uh, a team of Spanish speakers from the Spanish side of our, of our broadcast, which should be a lot of fun, but in the meantime, uh, he's going he's gonna to walk you through uh, some favorite games of his, and I hope you enjoy it. Sam, uh, I'll leave it with you. Thanks again. All right, uh, so welcome everybody, and uh, it looks like I got whatever was problem with my video sorted out because I'm not blurry anymore, so that's, uh, that's a good sign. I'm not really uh, good with technology, but... Um, I do my best. So the position we're looking at sister website here with here at uh, uh, Chess24, where you can get it on Chessable. So here I'm just putting that link in here. But um, so this book is all about past pawns, and I want to go over two of the games that I played that made it into the book. I try not to do too many of my own games in um, in lessons or in books, just because you don't learn as much. Uh, teaching your own stuff. And one of the biggest reasons I teach is to learn more myself, to study a topic and then share it with, um, with people and, uh, and to V drag on, yes, it's going to be lagging in 10 seconds. It does, it does that. But, um, uh, in any case here, we're talking about past pawns and the position we have here is from a game that I played with Gilberto Hernandez at the 2014 American continental. And this was definitely the critical game of the tournament for me where I, uh, I was half. Of, I played a mediocre but not terrible tournament so far. But because I was one of the top seeds, I was still only half a point out of first place. And I, knew, I really sort of needed a win in this game to to fight for first in the tournament. And here I had this situation where um, we have this sort of unbalanced end game where I have a bishop versus a knight, and I have four pawns versus three on the on the queen side, and he has uh, three pawns versus two on the king side. So uh, before we actually talk about this position in too much detail or talk about any moves, I just like to. Um, invite some of the people uh, watching to uh, take to note some things that they think are interesting about this position or say some things that they think will be important or relevant. Uh, in general, as I've said in my previous lessons, I don't believe in passive learning. I don't believe I can just talk at you and then you can just absorb what I say and become a better chess player. That's not going to work. You're going to have to interact with the material. That's uh, that's how this, that's how you become good at chess. And so, uh, yeah, at this point, I would just like to invite anyone who wants to, to, um, to try to, Maybe not necessarily figure out what move White should play, but talk about some of the key ideas that you see in this position. What's good about your position? What's not good? What you think your goal should be in the coming moves? Okay, so baby Quinn on the run says keeping black from putting a knight on d6. That is a very good point. You do not want to let black place a knight on d6. Uh, basically, knights are not necessarily the best blockaders of pass pawns in general, but they are definitely the best blockaders of specifically protected pass pawns. Um, because uh, when, if a knight were to get to d6, not only would it blockade the pawn, but it would also be pressuring the pawn that's protecting the pass pawn. So, uh, for example... If um if the pawns on c5 and uh, and c4 were gone, uh, black's best blockading piece, if it, as long as it could be safe, would probably actually be the king uh, on c on d6. But because it's specifically a protected pass pawn, the piece you want blockading it is the knight. So that would be very true. So Safed Hathi says white's pawn structure is better. Uh, the so I one could say that, but why is white's pawn structure necessarily better? Why would white have a better pawn structure in this position? All right. So the real question is the value of this protected pass pawn, as V Dragon has correctly pointed out. This pass pawn on d5, this is what we have to be thinking about. Uh, so a protected pass pawn is, there's, broadly speaking, there's three different kinds of pass pawns. There's lone pass pawns, which don't necessarily need to be isolated, but like 
for example, if that if White were to play D6, it would be a lone pass pawn because while it's not technically an isolated pawn, it's not really hasn't doesn't have any other pawns around it that can come to its aid. There can be connected pass pawns, which often can just run straight down the board. And then there can be protected pass pawns. And protected pass pawns have a certain long-term value in that the more pieces come off the board, uh, the more of a nuisance they will be because since no other pawn can no pawn can stop them from queening, and they uh, and they cannot be taken very easily because they're protected by a pawn. It can be it can often require one of your opponent's pieces to perform a vital defensive task. And I think the easiest way we can consider this is I think that if White could just swap off all the pieces right now, he would just reach a pawn endgame that I believe is winning. Uh, he would be able to bring his king and invade the king side. Like for example, if Black had to leave his king on e7. And White was able to start playing, um, let's say, King G4, H4, and then H5 or F4, F5 to open the king side. I think eventually he would win the game due to his protected pass pawn, which would significantly restrict the movement of Black's king. However, we're not yet at a king and pawn endgame. So we have to consider how likely is it for us to reach an endgame like that? How important is our protected pass pawn here. And also another important thing that people have touched down upon is that there is the other imbalance apart from the pawn structure is the piece assortment. Black has two knights and white has a bishop and knight. So uh, does the piece assortment favor white or black and why? So like people haven't figured this one out yet, but I'm going to give them a little more time before saying anything else. Okay, interesting. So people are thinking that actually the bishop is better than the knight. A good way of thinking about this, uh, and okay, but I am Kumar disagree. So this is good. We've got uh, some people saying that uh, some people seem to think that white's but that white's better because of the because of the bishop with pawns on both sides of the board. And some people seem to think that black's better because of the potential for the knight on d6. But I think what we can really point out is that this bishop on g2 this is a bad bishop. It can't go anywhere. It's, it's blocked by its own pawn on, d6, on d5. It cannot reach any useful squares. And I think uh, another thing we should be thinking about is what trades do each side want to make? Obviously, as I mentioned, White would love to just reach a king and pawn endgame. But in order to reach a king and pawn endgame, he'd have to be trading stuff along the way. It's not like we can just take all six pieces off the board at once. So each side should be thinking, well, a king and pawn endgame would be the best series of trades that, um, that White could expect. What is the best kind of trades? Imagine we could trade whatever pieces we want, but we have to be equal. We can't just say, oh, Black ends up with an extra exchange. But... What kind of trades would Black be most happy about here? Okay, so Scott says, okay, so people are saying that the rooks are coming off. Rooks, Black wants to um, trade the rooks. And he wouldn't mind getting to a knight versus bishop. So let's just make a few ridiculous moves to show what I mean. Um, so White's going to play rookie one. Obviously, this is stupid. It hangs the rook. Black plays rookie eight. We'll trade these guys. And then knight here, knight here, um, knight e5, knight takes e5. Obviously, this last sequence of move what moves was entirely ridiculous. There were a huge amount of hanging pieces for both sides. But my point is, this is kind of the end game that uh, that people are discussing, and we're gonna we're gonna see what's going on. Here, it turns out, uh, I'm not sure Black is just winning right away, but it's gonna be really really difficult for White. 
He's got no way to ever make use of this protected pass pawn on d5. He will constantly have to look out for the b6 to b5 advance. And black has a very easy plan. He's going to stick his king right in the center and then play f5 and then play g5 and then g4 and take all the space, eventually potentially combine this with threats to b5 to undermine this pawn on d5. And here, white has absolutely no counterplay. Black has all the winning chances. And if black ever wants to make a draw, like he just sticks his king on e5 and then plays f5, g5, and then we'll play king f6, king e5, back and forth over and over again. So uh, this would be um, really, really bad for white. I think that, uh, that this is basically the nightmare scenario. Conversely, if we were to say, let's, let's turn this into a dream scenario. And um, again, these moves are ridiculous, but uh, imagine we instead have a king and pawn on game like this. Here, uh, I think white is um, white is going to be doing very well. Uh, this protected pass pawn on d5 means that black's king is extremely limited in where it can go. It can never venture past the fifth rank. So, for example, in a position like this one here, um, white should pretty easily be able to get his king to the fourth rank and push black's king away just because black, for example, after a move like king to f3, cannot keep advancing with king d4. And here... Um, I think this position, this endgame is very promising for white and uh, probably just winning. For example, after something like f5, h4, h6, and king g3. Here, this this position is like a perfect example of, uh, of when the protected pass pawn will be good. Because now um, white is ready to play something like f4 check next, which will force black's king backwards instead of forwards. So after something like, I don't know, let's say b5 just to make a move. After... Um, after f4 check, specifically because of this imbalanced pawn structure, or white has the protected pass pawn, black has no way to challenge this pawn on d5 ever, and he can never bring his king forward as a result. If after king e4, if this g6 pawn or the h6 pawn could just migrate to d6, white could resign on the spot. But instead, he wins with d6. Black is then forced to go back, and after a move like h5, I think this game is now finished. Uh, because if g5 after fg and hg, h6, the pawns will promote. And following h6, g takes h5 and king h4, uh, white is obviously winning as well. So uh, I don't know. Maybe black can resist better in the pawn end game. Maybe f5 is a mistake, but uh, maybe he should play king f5 instead. I'm not sure. But uh, the king and pawn end game is very promising for white, potentially just winning. Well, similarly, a bishop versus knight, a lone, a lone knight versus bishop end game with a knight on d6 is very promising for black uh, and possibly just winning, but we're not sure. In any case, Using that knowledge, let's go back to the beginning position. So, of course, again, all of these moves were ridiculous, but I was just making them to, uh, to show what would happen if uh, under different circumstances of trades. So we're thinking which we now have a pretty good sense of which trades are going to favor white and which trades are going to favor black. Um, the next thing I have to think is how realistic is the possible or each of these possibilities. For example, it seems like what white really wants to do is trade his bishop for a knight. How realistic is that? Could that actually happen? It's like there's some lag, so I'm going to wait for people, but there we'll hopefully get some answers soon. So white could play knight e4, uh, as people are saying, but that trades knights. That doesn't trade bishops. After knight takes e4, you certainly wouldn't want to take the knight on d3 uh, because then knight d6 will come. And after something like bishop takes e4 and knight f4, it's going to be very, very hard to trade this bishop for the knight. So what we need to be thinking to ourselves is, is this protected pass pawn an asset for us? The only really way we're going to do that, we're, we're going to call this protected pass pawn a long-term asset, is if we can um, somehow engineer an exchange of the bishop for the knight, for one of the knights. And that seems more or less impossible. So the next thing we have to think about is what other value can a pass pawn have? Well, potentially it can just run down the board. So someone has asked about the move d6 here. 
that's a very serious move that you're going to want to consider. Uh, because if you have a pass pawn, one of the best things you can do is just shove it down the board until it becomes a queen. But unfortunately, it's never that easy, and, or it's seldom that easy, and your opponent will probably try to stop that pawn. D6 uh, takes this pawn, which was on a very, which is currently on a very safe square, and pushes it deep into black's position, where a lot of black pieces can um, can potentially harass the pawn. So, uh, in order to play D6, you're going to have to calculate the consequences and if you can hold on to this pawn or not. So, with that in mind, the most critical move in this position is D6. We're strategically speaking, we understand that we don't really want to leave this pawn on D5 because, in the long term, it's not helping us since we cannot get rid of this bishop versus knight problem, which uh, will clearly favor black if black, um, if black gets uh, the knight to d6. So let's try to, let's try to calculate some variations. Uh, if white were to play d6, what would happen next? So Belouf is said to stop d6, we play d6 ourselves, and if rook d8, knight f3, keeping the pawn alive with tactics. Okay, that's a good start. I can't take the pawn immediately after knight f3. So for example here, uh, Belouf is given d6, rook d8, knight f3. And now if black were foolish enough to take on d6, white wins on the spot, what should he play? So everyone is, uh, is giving bishop f1, or I don't know, 91 or 95. Uh, in general, always just pick the most precise way. Guys, if you play 95, you're going to win this game unless you do something really stupid. Uh, sure, just always just actually take a piece. I mean, this is, it's better to take a piece than an exchange. Uh, I mean, 95 was good enough, without question, but just... Make sure you're counting material right. A piece is better than an exchange. In any case, both moves are winning. Easy enough. Uh, so we figured out that rook takes d6 can't happen, but of course black can move this knight. And after a move like knight f4, uh, there's still very legitimate concerns for the safety of this d6 pawn. It wasn't captured immediately, but the question is, can we follow up with something better? Uh, someone else had suggested in this position knight e4. We're going to get back to knight f3 because that's how the game went. But in, someone else had suggested knight e4. But I dislike this move because after knight takes e4, you cannot take with the rook because then d6 will fall. So you must play bishop takes c4. And after knight f4, unfortunately for white, I don't actually see how he's going to save the d6 pawn because black is ready to... I don't, for, let me put it this way. I don't see how we're going to stop the move knight d4. And given that... Um, and given that knight d4 is, um, is coming, it's going to be very hard to save d6. I don't see a great way. So with that in mind, let's return to the position um, after knight f3. And now knight f4 comes. This position is very hard to evaluate. Um, but I think white should be pretty concerned about his pawn on d6 if he doesn't do something pretty direct. Uh, and this was what I had to calculate when I decided whether to play d6 or not. And here variations are very important. What should white play now? Okay, so a lot of people are suggesting the move knight e5. Uh, but I'm asking if, I'm wondering if any of them had seen the response knight e2 check and knight d4 when the d6 pawn becomes a problem. Uh, 
And then Gustav Brank has said here that white can play knight c6. And after rook takes d6, knight takes d4, uh, black is going to end up with an extra pawn. White will have very obvious compensation because the d4 pawn is going to be firmly blockaded and he can hope to make a c passer. But a simple head count should be enough to know that I think black does not risk too much here. This, this certainly doesn't look bad for him to me. I think he's at least fine, potentially better. Um, and the problem is here, after knight d4, uh, this d6 pawn seems to be lost. So going back to the original position, we're thinking, can we play d6? The first thing, it seems like we're running into this problem uh, that after d6, there will follow uh, knight f3, rook d8, uh, or d6, rook d8, knight f3, knight f4, knight e5, and then black will have knight e2 check, king f1, knight d4, and the pawn is going to be lost on d6. And it seems like, okay, I want to play d6, but I can't do it because my opponent has this tactical resource, which wins the pawn. Uh, and this is something I've talked about basically in every single piece of chess instruction I've ever done, uh, starting with my video series at iChess and all throughout here at Chess24 and Chessable, basically every single thing I've ever done in chess instruction, I've, I've talked about this same theme, which is here White has a key strategic idea. He wants to play d6. His opponent is sort of stopping him from doing so, because after d6, rook d8, knight f3, knight f4, knight e5, or white's not in time to play knight e5 because of knight e2 check and knight g4. Uh, but whenever you have a key strategic idea that you want to play, in this case d6, and your opponent is preventing you from doing so, the first question you always want to ask yourself is what happens if I do it anyway? And you can start looking for tactical resources that can help you justify these positional goals. For example, somebody had given this variation where after d6, rook d8 there, white was playing knight c6. And at that moment, after rook takes d6, knight takes d4, white has lost his pawn, but gets some compensation for it. However, uh, white has an even better way of executing this same idea. And you really want to try to see it from afar. So let's see if from this position, anybody can give me a complete variation, uh, which, um, which shows that white will not lose the d pawn. So it looks like Balof has found the right idea. Let's see if anybody else has. Yeah, Balov got it. Let's see anyone else? So, well, Vereen, yes, all this kind of process is explained in my book, which I will shamelessly plug here as well. Um, to all the lives I could ever live, I think your variation is... Um, is not right because after after d6 rook d8 i believe you mean knight e4 not knight e5 then after knight takes e4 bishop takes e4 knight f4 and d7 i think at that moment like black can play knight e2 check and knight d4 blocking your rook and then you will lose the d7 pawn so it seems like people are starting to get it so we had previously seen this line after d6 rook d8 knight f3 knight f4, knight e5, knight e2 check, king f1, knight d4, knight c6, one after rook takes d6, knight takes d4, 
we get this kind of position where white has compensation for the pawn down. But white can improve upon this line by playing this fancy move d7, pointing out that black can't comfortably take it because after knight takes d7, knight c6, black now cannot take on c6 as after bishop c6, he will be in a crushing pin. And once he moves the rook, we will have a very similar position to the previous variation with the notable exception that white is not a pawn down anymore and that he has good compensation for material equality. And here white's clearly better because his bishop on the open board suddenly has become very useful and he could just mobilize his queen side very quickly with b4 and c5 or play rook d6 to harass these weak pawns. And in the meantime, white's knight at, black's knight on d7 will struggle to find a stable square. And this looks very pleasant for white. So the first thing we can realize is that at this point, black cannot simply go knight e2 check and knight d4 and gobble up this pawn. Honestly, once you have figured that out, probably you should just go for uh, d6. You don't need to calculate it complete all the way to completion because you know that the game is going the wrong direction if you don't get d6 in. And here we're aware that we get d6 and black cannot scoop up the pawn that easily. Uh, but there's still a lot more to do. So we'll get back to 92 check um, because that was played in the game. But black has some other resources here. So uh, this... Uh, White would like to advance this pawn as far as possible. So let's suppose black tries to stop this pawn from going any further and blockade it on the d7 square. How should white react to this move? And to Scott, that's exactly right. You need to open the position for your bishop. This bishop is a fantastic long range piece that does not like biting on your own granite on d5. And to Mr. Squiddy, yes, I'm reading the Chess 24 chat exclusively. I don't know how other people manage to make the board big enough so that they can set up a position and have this little wheel uh, big enough that you could, the board big enough that you can click on the wheel and see the Chess 24 chat and see the YouTube chat. I just can't do it. So I'm sorry. I'm only reading the Chess 24 chat. Uh, so to the YouTube people, I'm sorry. I, I can't see you. Uh, you just have to comment on Chess 24. All right. So here people are suggesting knight c6. And now, um, okay, so Hamid has Azuz is suggesting taking bishop c6. But I like the way the other people are playing better. The problem is after taking and then, uh, let's say, bishop c6, rook d8. Here the problem is it's not so easy to get d7 through. Uh, because if you play d7 now, again, this move knight e2 check and the knight comes to d4 is going to be really, really annoying. Because that bishop is going to get hit and it doesn't have a great place to go. Like after this... It's funny, like at this point, it looks like very silly to say, oh, black's going to go gobble up that d7 pawn before you can do anything about it. But in fact, I think that's actually exactly what will happen after knight d4. I don't see how white's going to get himself out of this one. Um, so, and again, this sort of falls back to what we we're talking about before, and that this bishop is not the best piece when we're trying to get this pawn through, and that we'd really rather have a knight. And so I quite like the suggestion that everyone else has given, which is knight to c6. Now, black cannot place his rook on any of these squares, this knight e7 check, or of course, b8 is hanging. And if rook c8 or rook a8, knight e7 check will win the rook. So black would have to try rook e8, and then people have correctly found this line, knight e7 check, and let's say king f8, and bishop c6. Now, black must play rook d8 to maintain material equality. And here, uh, white still needs to play accurately, but he, I, I believe he's now winning. Let's see if you guys can figure out how he should proceed. This point also highlights another one of these key values of past pawns.
Let's see you. Wow. All right. So let me win and Mr. Squiddy have got this right. We want to take this knight and then go knight c8. And basically, while this pass pawn on d6 is not really in danger of becoming a queen anytime soon, black has it pretty well blockaded. The problem that black is facing is that because this pawn is dangerous and it requires his pieces to do some blockading, now he is entirely unable to defend this pawn on b6. Uh, which is about to fall because, of course, rook b7, which would be the move that he would like to play to defend this pawn, uh, is going to be met by g7 when white wins. So here black has two things he can try. If he plays knight e2 check, this is pretty simple. After uh, king to g2, knight to d4, knight takes b6, rook takes d6, and knight a4, uh, white is winning this pawn on c5 because if black were to play uh, rook c6, well, there's just a basic tactic. But let's just see if people can find it. Yes, to V-Dragon, that's exactly right. Knight c5 anyway. And here black cannot take the knight because of rook takes d4. I mean, he can't take the knight, but after rook d4, we get the piece back with an extra pawn. And unfortunately for black, there is no good desperado with this knight. There's no like knight takes b3 because the knight is defending it. We can't do that. This is also, by the way, why I think it's better to put the king on, um, on g2 instead of f1. King f1 might look more natural in this position, but following knight d4, knight b6, rook d6, knight a4, uh, rook c6 takes. In this position, I might worry a little bit about knight f3 when this h2 pawn can become a target. It's probably not such a big deal after knight d7 check and king g2, but I think this is a, it's, it's a good point. It, that, that just explains why I decided to put the, I would put the king on g2 instead of f1. So uh, the other thing black can do in this position instead of trying to go after the d6 pawn, because basically what happened there was he lost both c5 and, uh, and b6 for d6, which is not a good trade. Black can try to save his b pawn. Uh, but this also doesn't solve his problems. Now, how can white bring the game to its conclusion? There's a couple ways, but I have one that I like the most. So seven has b4 might work there. Um, if I play knight e6, b5, you're probably winning that, but knight takes c5 is much simpler. All right, so a lot of people are saying knight b6. This is a good start. Uh, but here um, you have to uh, mix ideas a little bit. And it looks like, yeah, uh, Balouf and Scott have got this right. So now essentially at this point, uh, Black still has this d pawn reasonably well under control. But the problem is that he's had to keep his pieces so tied down to the defense of that that he's, uh, he's completely unable to just stop a second pass pawn. So I think the easiest way now is to play... Uh, C takes B5, and it looks like people are figuring this out. C takes B5, and then A4. And this guy is just going to run straight to the finish line without any resistance, and uh, and white should win pretty routinely. Um, B4 has been mentioned. This wins too, but it's not as easy. Uh, it will take a bit more effort, and I think that C takes B5 and A4 is a cleaner win. Um, so, okay, this works very nicely. Uh, black is not in time to play knight d7 because of this knight c6 resource and knight e7 check and then taking the knight on d7, knight c8, and white's going to win. So my next question is, what if black takes on g2 and tries to deploy this same idea, uh, except by including uh, knight takes g2 and king takes g2, says, you know what, I'm not going to let you trade your bishop for the d7 knight. It will only trade for the f4 knight instead. And as a result now, it's going to be much harder for you to just kick my pieces away as the knight on d7 is a good blockader. However, this also is insufficient. White is winning now. What should he play?
So Cthulhu's got it right. Let's see if anyone else does. Yeah, theater of crazy. Okay, so people are starting to get this. Um, so the best thing white can do is take on d7 and go king f3. And the point is, yeah, people are noticing this king gets straight to c6. And black is just one tempo too slow to stop it. So for example, after f5, attempting to control the e4 square and white goes king f4, king f7. Uh, if if white were to fall asleep at the wheel for a move here and do something stupid, I don't know, like uh, a4, then after king f6, white's probably, he might just lose. Like I might just go like h6, g5, kick your king away, king e6, take this pawn and then win. But of course, white's not going to fall asleep. He's going to go king e5. And this king comes to c6 and then he will promote the pawn very easily. So, um, so black was not in time to do this either. Which quickly means that we're we're running out of reasonable things black can try, uh, and in the game he did end up playing knight e2 check, king f1 and knight d4, and then d7, uh, which we had discussed before. Now we had realized that knight takes d7 wasn't great for black. He pro he maybe should have done it anyway because he's worse there but not dead yet. Uh, but he tried another move, which was a very natural and very human idea. He played h5, but this also wasn't great. What is the point of playing h5? Yeah, so uh, knight g4 is the main idea. If black is able to play knight g4 uh, and exchange off these knights, then d7 will fall, and then you just lose uh, because you'll be left with a bad bishop against an outposted knight and a pawn down. So if black is allowed to play knight g4, you are done for. And that pawn on d7 still is potentially vulnerable. So white has to be very careful here. What should he play? All right, so we have f3, h3, and bishop h3 suggested. These are the three moves that stop knight g4. Uh, but first of all, f3 we can't do uh, because f3 there's going to be knight takes d7, and we no longer have this knight c6 resource. And now um, at this point, the game's over. Uh, but there's people, but bishop h3 and h3 are the moves that people are thinking about. And to people who say bishop h3 or h3, sorry, you only get to choose one move. Uh, try to actually support the move that you're choosing with an actual reason behind it, because uh, these two moves are not created equal. Okay, so it seems like a lot of people are playing h3. The problem with the move h3 is that without having the square available for the bishop, this pawn now becomes very hard to defend. Uh, because um, because here after king f8, 
Of course, we can't take this pawn, at least not comfortably right now, thanks to the knight c6 tactic. But after king f8, now black, honest to goodness, is threatening to take that pawn on d7. And how exactly are we going to stop him from doing that? I don't really see how it's gonna how we're gonna stop him. Uh, and here I think black is doing quite well. So let's discuss bishop h3. Uh, people, a lot of people have said they dislike this for general grounds because the bishop uh, is good on this diagonal. I'm not sure what it was doing there. It didn't seem like it was doing that much. But here with bishop h3, white, white has uh, lended more support to the g4 square while also defending the d7 pawn. Now, someone had suggested the variation king f8, rook takes d4, and then knight c6. But this doesn't impress me because after rook takes d7, I think this knight endgame should be about equal. I don't see why white would be better here. Um, I to Bogdan Gramesha, I have calculated farther than this. I didn't calculate it perfectly, but I calculated farther than this. Uh, so after bishop h3, uh, what's black actually going to play? Okay, so Wolverine has suggested g5. That makes some sense. Okay, so a lot of people are giving g5. This makes perfect sense. Uh, white is protecting this pawn along this long diagonal. Black wants to play g5, g4, close down that diagonal, and uh, and take the pawn. This looks like a problem. What's white going to do about it? Uh, to Balouf, I wasn't in a must-win situation, but I was in a situation where I would quite like a win. This seems scary for white, but it's all, it's scary, but also promising because if things go wrong, it will go really wrong. But at the same time, if this works, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to get this pawn all the way to D7. And at the same time, I felt like I sort of had to go for it because I really did not like my position uh, if black was allowed to play it the night on D6. That said, I calculated for 30 minutes before, uh, before playing D6. That's one of my longest things I've ever done. And I, I didn't calculate perfectly, but I calculated almost everything right. So after g5, the question is, what happens now? So uh, someone has suggested f3, which makes a lot of sense to stop g4. But here I think black is OK. He can potentially play g4 anyway, for example. And this, I think, should liquidate to a draw. Uh, for example, after hg, let's say knight takes d7, knight d7. And this looks very much equal to me. Uh, I don't think white's h pawns are particularly scary. And uh, I don't know. I mean. I suppose both sides sort of have their chances, but I think the, the likelihood of a draw here is very, very high. Um, and there, But again, if you think this is the only thing black can do and he has to find all these moves to make the draw, fine. But white has something better than this. F3 is not the best move. White has something stronger. What should he play? Think about the only point of g5. He wants to shut down this diagonal, but there's a way that you can make sure that the bishop has a secure square. Okay, Remy Sodervas has found this. Um, rook takes d4 is the best move. And after c takes d4, bishop f5, uh, this is actually quite a pretty picture. Black is completely stalemated. Uh, there is absolutely no piece that can move. Uh, because if he moves the knight, there will follow knight c6. If he moves the rook, there will also follow knight c6. The king can never come to e7, because then knight c6. The king can never come to h6, because then knight f7. These pawns can move, but they get stuck on... Uh, they get stuck on g4 and h4, and then they can't go anything further. These pawns don't do anything. Black literally is just completely stuck. He cannot make a single move, and white has a very easy winning plan. King e2, king d3, king d4, b4, c5, c6, c7, and there's not a darn thing black can do about it. There's just no piece in his position that can move.
So going back, uh, we've now busted G5. Uh, this is a, quite a nice solution. Um, instead, Black played knight G4, uh, basically saying, well, bishop H3, the, the move was sort of an attempt to prevent Black from playing knight G4. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm going to try to overload White's ability to defend the, uh, the D7 pawn, but luckily White has a good response here as well. Let's see if you guys can figure out how White should proceed. Uh, yes, I saw this far before D6. I took, I fought for 30 minutes. It was a very long thing, one of my longest ever. Because uh, much like a lot of the people in the chat here, I was worried about D6. I thought if I miscalculate something, I'm going to drop this pawn and lose the game without a fight. Well, if my pawn's on D5, I mean, okay, my position isn't fantastic, but with equal material and a protected pass pawn, I have, I shouldn't be in that terrible shape. But, um, but yeah, this was a moment. There's no way I would have calculated this far if I had less time, for example. But I, it took me a full half hour on my clock to do this. One of my longest things ever. So try to give a variation here. What should white play? So I am Kumar, my longest think was 48 minutes. And I came up with something a lot like this, which was really brilliant, I think. But again, I didn't see everything, but I saw a lot. Maybe I'll show that game another time. The computer rained on my parade in that very in that line in a couple of moments, but uh, it was still really cool. All right, so everyone seems to want to play bishop takes g4. Uh, the problem with bishop g4, hg, and knight takes g4 is that after something like king g7, I don't see how you're going to save your pawn. Of course, black can't take this pawn on d7 directly. That would be ill-advised due to the fork. But after king g7, if you play knight e5, I'm ready to play f6. And otherwise, I just don't see how you're going to save... Uh, the pawn on d7. So here I think black is absolutely fine and could potentially even look to be better since he has a better structure later on, plus a well-outposted knight. Um, I don't know. This uh, this seems like not that great for, for white. But uh, after knight g4, there's a better way. See if anybody can find a forced one here. Okay. Uh, so people are suggesting various moves. Um, Okay, so a lot of people are suggesting rook d4, c d4, knight c6 takes an f3, but this I don't understand. Black can play rook c7 or rook d6 or something, and I think he's winning. Um, so that seems pretty good for black. Uh, okay, so Miral Yub Sirovich has uh, suggested the variation that I had actually calculated when I... Um, when I had uh, played d6 at the first point. And it looks like Abdu is uh, 
has figured it out. So bishop takes g4 is the best move. And after h takes g4, um, here, what I had calculated during my long think was b4, overloading, trying to overload this knight on d4, who obviously can't move on pain if knight c6. Then, um, so Bodo has it right. But here, uh, after f6, what I had calculated was bc, bc, and now this move rook takes d4. When after b takes, c takes d4 and c5, white is winning because his pawn makes it to c7 uh, too fast. Um, but then I realized that after rook takes d4, black can play f takes c5. And here, uh, white is better, but I think black's drawing chances in a rook end game like this one are pretty high. I'm going to take both of these pawns and lose d7 and end up with one pawn up, but with four isolated pawns against three isolated pawns and a not-so-active king and a lot of stuff potentially ready to get traded. I think black's drawing chances are probably higher than white's winning chances. So then when I, but, so I, I had not actually seen rook takes d4 in this position when I had calculated d6 on the first move. I had only seen b4. Uh, but rook takes d4 is a much better move order because now black is not able to respond to rook takes d4 with f takes e5. If he plays f6 here, knight c6 wins on the spot. And after c takes d4, b4, it turns out that black is just a tempo too slow to stop this pawn from getting to c7. Now, my opponent actually resigned here, uh, and it's fine. I mean, he's lost, but uh, there, he did have a couple more tricks he could try. Um, so if f6, of course I don't move my knight, I will go c5. And after f takes e5, c6, king f7, c7, and king e7. Of course, very easy, but just uh, what should white play here? People still haven't typed in yet because there's going to be a delay, but my guess is by the time you hear me say this, people will have typed in the answer. So I'm just going to assume people have found C8 queen by now. Of course, we don't take the rook. That would be bad. Then black would get a one pawn on game. But after C8 queen, uh, the extra queen is certainly decisive. C8 bishop, very clever. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but let's suppose instead in this position, black tried something like B takes C5, B takes C5. And then he played d3, hoping to mobilize the, uh, the b pawn. All right, all you under promoters, you're actually very funny. Uh, so let's suppose black tries to mobilize the b pawn with d3. How does white proceed now? So yeah, people are saying c6, d2, king e2, yep. Let's play f takes e5. Now one more good move. What should I play here? Yeah, people got it. You got to play king. You have to play king d1. Uh, you have to be very careful here because uh, if you play c7, this is a very bad way to lose a chess game. After uh, d1 queen, it's all over because after takes and rook takes d7, you lose. And you actually don't want to take this pawn either because then after um, king f7, you're still not in time to play c7 because of rook takes d7. And after something like uh, king to e3, king to e7, c7, and king takes d7. Here, black is going to get a pawn on him that he may be able to hold. Uh, but, of course, white should just play king d1, keeping this pawn alive, and now black is not in time to play to stop c7 followed by c8. So I was very happy with this game. Uh, it, it, I was very satisfied with, my, with the calculation I had done, but a lot of that stemmed... The reason that I felt the need to do this calculation in the first place and look at all these very long lines uh, was that... Um, uh, was that I felt like the position was not going my way if um, uh, if I didn't play d6. And the large, a, lot, a large part of that was just understanding about pass pawns and realizing that my protected pass pawn on d5, if we go back to the beginning position, was just not that valuable a resource uh, because 
it, the protected pass pawn in general is um, is better as more pieces get traded off and is more of a long-term resource than a short-term resource. But what I was finding was that because I specifically couldn't trade my bishop for his knight, uh, the more pieces traded off, the more I was going to get closer to an endgame that I really didn't want with a with a, a bad bishop against a good knight, and where that bad that good knight blockading this protected pawn, the best possible blockader, would leave me in a really bad way. That led me to start looking at d6 and calculating to the extent that I could. And I was very happy with the calculations I did. I did not see everything. I did not see rook takes d4 after um, knight g4, bishop g4, hg, as we saw there. I'd only seen b4 in advance. But uh, look, if you want to calculate everything in advance every game, first of all, you're going to fail. And second of all, you're going to get into massive time pressure. So at some point, I just had to make a decision. And I think actually looking back now, I'm actually a little bit disappointed in my... Um, in my thought process that uh, that I didn't play d6 faster. I think at some point I should have just said, look, this is promising, this looks very good. I haven't worked it all out to completion, but I can't see how I'm gonna lose this pawn. I don't like the way the game is going otherwise. And I shouldn't have necessarily burned all that time. Now it turned out it worked out okay. But, but let's suppose I'd only ended up better instead of winning uh, at the end of the line. Then I might've regretted using so much time to get there. Uh, in any case, unless anyone has any further questions on this game, I prepared another one for today. Now, this one went longer than I was expecting, so the next one we're going to have to be pretty brisk on. But uh, unless anyone has any questions, we're going to move on. I'm just going to grab a glass of water. I'll be right back. Is it important to be physically fit to play chess at a top level? Yes, absolutely. I take fitness very seriously. I'm a pretty athletic guy, I would, I would say, actually. Um, at least by American standards, I'm extremely fit. By the worldly standards, I would say I'm very fit. But, yeah, I mean, if you look at – I mean, a healthy mind and a healthy body go hand in hand. I mean, it's no surprise that uh, the, the best chess players in the world are athletic, young, and, uh, and in good form. And it's also no surprise that the best physical athletes in the world are not just a bunch of big, dumb Herculeses that can, you know, throw things really far and lift things really heavy and stuff like that. They're, they tend to be very thoughtful people as well, uh, because I don't think a healthy mind and healthy body, you, you can't have one without the other, really. Um, in any case, we're going to move on and look at the next game. So let me just paste the fen here. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So here we have another game. Uh, hang on, this one was, um, oh, sorry, uh, black played rook d8. And then uh, b5, we'll start here. Uh, so this was another game that was featured in my book. This is a game I had with Akshat Chandra, and I had the white pieces here. And at this point, I believe, yeah, this was move 43. So he had just gotten more time. And he has a very critical decision to make. Obviously, black has a difficult position because um, uh, we have this four on four, but white already has two connected fast pawns, while black doesn't have any. So he's clearly trying to defend, but at the same time, he does have defensive resources here, and he has some time for it, and he has some time to use. So I'd like everyone to take some time here and see if they can figure out the best way for Black to offer some resistance, and then I'll talk a little bit about the position.
Okay, so Belif has come up with rook d1, check in rook b1. Try to undouble the pawns by playing f4. Are mating threats any realistic? Yes, definitely. So let's discuss this position a little bit. Uh, basically what's gonna happen here is white is going to promote his two pass pawns. This is the first thing you should realize. He has connected pass pawns and your king is far away. But one thing you should know about, let's suppose white were to play a4 next move, which technically you can't stop him from doing. When we have this situation in a rook end game, like let's say a pure just one rook for each side, where if white side has connected pass pawns with pawn, defending pawn, defending rook, defending pawn like this, that formation always guarantees promotion. You will not stop the pawns. However, it also means that the pawns are going to be extremely slow. Because if you can imagine a situation where, let's say, white has a pawn on a4 and something like this, and black has his rook on b4, and then white has to go b6, and then he can't go b7, he can't go rook a7, he has to go a5, and then rook a7, and then b7, it will take a very long time to get these guys through. So what Black needs to do is get counterplay, and he needs it immediately. So uh, in addition, what he needs to do is make sure that White's Rook cannot come to a better square. In general, when your opponent has connected past pawns and you can't stop them, the best thing you can do is slow them down enough that you can make trouble on the other side of the board. And in my opinion, this is something I talk a lot about in the book, which I will again uh, shamelessly plug here in a few seconds, uh, is that um, is that if you can stick your opponent's pieces in front of their own past pawns, that will slow them down a lot. And right now, White's rook is very poorly placed. It is stuck in front of his own past pawns, and you do not want to let that rook improve. I'll just type in the link now. Um, but uh, so, for example, in the game, Black played rook d2. Now, this was a losing move, and at this point, it's still a lot of work for White to win the game. But the real problem was, uh, here I was able to play b6. And now, I think what must have happened is my opponent was planning on taking f2. But this is a bad move. What should White play now to win the game on the spot? All right, Gustav Brenk has it, rook a3. Transferring this rook to b3, a much better square. If white were foolish enough to play a4, this pawn gets blocked, and then after something like a5 and g4 and check, and here, this is how white ends up losing. He's, he could just get checkmated in like three more moves. Uh, this we don't want. So, um, but of course, rook a3, as people are pointing out, uh, and here, once the rook comes to b3, this pawn will promote. And the rook on a3 also, on that third rank, conveniently also stops this pawn from getting to uh, the g3. And this game is finished. For example, um, I don't even know what black wants to try. Rook d2, rook b3, rook d8. As soon as black's rook gets passive like this, white just cruises straight through with absolutely no resistance. That's quite easy. Um, in the game, though, black played rook b2. And here, uh, it turns out a4 did win. Uh, I could have won the race, but what I really did, what I what I played here also won, and that was g3. And basically here what I've done is I have given my king a lot of breathing room and also stopped black from playing f4. So the game continued um, king g6, king g2, and then uh, I don't even remember what he played here, but um, let me just look it up, hang on. Was, uh, no, it's not this one. It was, uh, this one here. Yeah. Okay. So here he played. Um, he played h5, a4, f4, and I, I have to give him credit. He was doing the right thing here. Uh, he was trying to make counterplay of some kind, and after um, 
G takes F4, G4. It's clear Black is, you know, going to play H4 and potentially G3 later. So there's definitely problems for me to solve, but it was too slow. I played A5, and after H4, uh, let's see if anybody can find the winning move for White here. Okay, so John Tadros has got it right. Um, you want to be very careful in these positions. And here, uh, while these pawns are guaranteed to queen, you don't need to promote both of them. One of them is quite enough. And if you play rook a7, while this does guarantee the pawn's promotion, it's painfully slow because you'll have to go b7, a6, rook a8. And after something like king f5, say b7, chop, a6, and h3 check, I think white's just begging to get himself mated here. And he's probably going to get what he deserves. Uh, after something like king g1, g3, this seems to be mate. Um, uh, and then if king h2, g3 check, takes, rook takes f2, white ends up losing the race. Uh, but if white is more to the point and instead plays rook to a8 directly, uh, now his next he's threatening to play a6, which will win the game on the spot. Uh, and black doesn't really have a great way to stop it. If he tries g3, then I can play a6. Rook takes f2 check, king to g1. And at this point, black is not in time to play h3 because white has rook g8 check in the air. Uh, and here, uh, white's pawns will queen first and he will win. Uh, so, um, so instead, after rook a8, black played uh, king f5. And then after, and here, this, this is very clever now because I'm not threatening a6 anymore. If I were to play a6 now, after rook takes b6, black is holding because following a7 and rook a6, I no longer have a check on g8. Uh, so here, because the king is safe from checks, I couldn't play a6 yet. So uh, after king f5, what should white play? All right, so Contiello has found it, um, and Welverine as well. Rook h8 is the best move. This uh, threatens the pawn on h4 and gets behind it, so it makes it hard to advance further. And now white is ready to play a6, and then either a7 or b7 next. Um, rook f8 is less accurate, because here I am concerned about g3. Now after a6 takes, the problem is king h3 gets mated in one after... Um, after uh, rook to h2, so I'd have to bring the king back. And now I think I'm actually going to lose this race because uh, h2 check is not kidding around. And here, like, if you look at this position, you have to play um, uh, rook to h8, and, um, and you'd have to play rook h8 anyway, so you may as well have gone there on the first move. By starting with rook h8, uh, this has also avoided the move g3, which is the most dangerous thing black could try. Uh, because then white will have rook takes h4 taking that pawn, and then he wins very routinely. So here, uh, black is forced to play h3 check, which is something he really does not want to do, uh, he, because this uh, means he has to give up on playing g3. So uh, what should white play now?
pretty easy, but still we should do. Uh, yeah, so basically anything other than uh, King H2 is fine. And as soon as somebody said something else, um, King G1 is fine. King G3 is also fine. I believe they should transpose uh, because black is going to give a check and then bring the rook back to... Um, against either King G1 or King G3, black is going to give a check and then put the king rook back on B2. Uh, so yeah, Scott has the variation right uh, here at this point. If you had started with king h2 directly, like every tempo matters here. And after rook takes f2 check, now black is winning because after uh, king g3, there is rook g2 check and h2 and white is mated. And if the king comes back to g1, uh, I think black now wins with rook b2. One after a6, he can play g3, rook takes h3 and king g4 and... Uh, at the very least, Black will have a perpetual check, but no, he's just he will just give mate with King F3 next. Uh, there's nothing White can do, um, and this is lost all of a sudden. Every tempo counts in these positions, so what White does is he gains a tempo by playing King G3, check, and now Rook B2. And we saw this position a second ago with Black to move where Black wins, but in this case, White is winning. He goes A6, and after uh, Rook takes F2 check, of course not King G3. Again, there is Rook G2 check and H2. Uh, but after King G1, um, white is good to go. So black tried G3, and here I, now I was able to take his pawn. And again, uh, this position here, we saw this position a second ago, white's a move, but his pawn was back on A5. Or, so, or, no, or no, we had this exact position, but black's rook was on B2, and there white is lost, but here white is winning because he is in time to play um, rook to H8 with the point that... Um, Following king f3, uh, what does white play now? Be very careful, but it does win. Yeah, so V-Dragon has it right. It's very important to specifically promote the A-pawn as we will promote with check. If we were to play something like uh, B7, this is a very bad way to lose a chess game. We're now mated. Uh, but A7 instead, and now A8 queen will come with check after Rook B2, A8 queen. Black is not in time to play Rook B1 and must resign. Uh, so this was a very complex end game. Uh, in the game, Black tried Rook to B2, but it didn't matter. I mean, he, he tried this, but it, it didn't work. He tried to give perpetual, but after King F1... He couldn't because if rook b1, my king escapes. And as soon as I can sacrifice my escape with my king, his g pawn won't matter. I'll sack my rook if I need to. Um, so he tried g2 check. But finally, at the end of all this, following uh, king g1, king g3, check. If king f3 again promoting comes with queen, you don't want comes with check. You don't want to play. Um, well, you don't want to allow rook b1, rook h1 mate. So uh, he tried king h3. And then finally, I was able to make a queen. And here black resigned. Uh, what if we play rook takes g3 to John Detros? That gets to some pretty goofy position. Um, chop, chop, and I guess, I don't know, let's play a7 and I go rook a2. Uh, this is going to get very goofy and it could end up looking like a study because black may have some hope for perpetual against uh, against the, um, the king on g1. I don't know. It's my guess is this is winning. I mean, usually they have to specifically compose these positions so that they are draws in here. I don't think that's the case. Uh, it seems like white will get away. I don't think black can chase him forever like this here. Check. And now if king c1, rook back to a2, but king a1. And I don't see how black is getting out of this one. I do believe rook takes g3 would have won. But it's easier to just play rook to h8 so that you can play a7 and a8 queen. As long as you notice that you're able to queen with check, uh, you win the game. So, um, But here basically what we found was in that all of these races, black ended up losing by a single tempo. Now going back to the original position where we picked up the game, where black played rook d2 and rook b2. Whether or not one tempo was the critical amount, I mean, of course, you could never calculate all this to completion from here. That's outside of human capability. But regardless, it should be very clear uh, how Black could have improved this variation starting at the top. So what should Black have done here that was different than what he did?
All right, so Gustav Brecht has it, right? Uh, we need to, we de Black definitely needs to get his rook behind uh, this, this B pawn, and he cannot let white reroute his rook. Uh, so, like, for example, if Black were to play F4, I'd be very concerned about the move rook C6 when white's rook suddenly doesn't end up so stupidly placed. Uh, this seems pretty bad. Um, but the big thing is rook D1 to B1 would have gained him a very critical tempo. Essentially, the way the game went was he played rook, D, rook to the D file, rook down, then rook to the B file in two moves. And in those two moves, I played B6 and then G3. As it turns out, A4 was winning here. But instead, by playing rook D1 check, king H2, rook B1 and B6, essentially, he played rook D1, rook B1 instead of rook D2, rook B2. This should be of roughly equal value, these moves. He got the rook behind the pawn. That's what mattered. Well, in the meantime... In the previous case, I was able to play the two moves B6, G3, or B6, A4 would have also won. In this particular case, I've had to play B6, King, H2. And King, H2 is not really worse than King, H1. It's just a wasted move, completely wasted. And as we were finding, one tempo really meant all the difference in these positions. Now, black plays F4 before white has the time to play G3 and slow him down. And here, white's king is not getting out, and already black is looking at, very simple, h5, g4, h4, f5, g3. That's one, two, three, four, five moves. Black is going to checkmate white in five moves here. In the meantime, when we count what white does, a4, a5, rook a8, rook to the side, a6, and then queen the pawn, that's one, two, three, four, five. I don't know. White queens the pawn in seven moves. Black gives mate in five. White's not winning this race. So, for example, here, after something like a4, g4, a5, h5, already here, I think it's time for White to, like, start looking for ways to force a draw. If he just continues along, like, pushing his pawns with something like rook a7, check king g6, and b7, after h4, he can resign. He is, he is just done for. Uh, this is checkmate. I don't believe he's getting out of it. Um, I don't know, maybe he can try G3 and hope for a miracle, but no, just chop and F3 and this game is finished. Um, so uh, Baby Queen on the run has suggested after F4, what if White plays G3 still? That makes some sense, but at the same time, uh, if we recall the way the game went, uh, Black had to play F4 and sacrifice a pawn to liquidate the pawns, and here if he does something like, I guess F takes G3 would be my instinct. Uh, this is still... Um, this is still very difficult for uh, for white. It's like, for example, after, say, king takes g3 and h5, and this h-pawn is coming, and let's say a4, h4 check, and then, I don't know, king to wherever, h3, rook b3 check, and g4. I think black's pawns are every bit as dangerous as white's, and at this point, white needs to, uh, to call it a day and, and look for ways to save the game. As soon as white realizes that he's not better and he needs to make a draw here, it's not wildly difficult. For example, after... Um, after a4, g4, in this position here, um, white can try g3 at this moment. And let's say uh, after f3, a5, I think at this point, um, black can't play rook f1 because of b7, and then rook b6 will come. But black can play rook b2. And here I think that white should just go king g1, and I think this should end in a draw with rook b1 check and rook b2. I don't see how either side can do any better. Black's going to be way too slow if he has to play like f5, f4, h5, h4. That's not really going to work. Uh, but if white is foolish enough to just keep pressing along, is pressing his luck with rook a8 and then check, and then, I don't know. This, this actually is probably also a draw. Here, rook b2, rook c8. And then at this point, white's ready for a6 next, but he's not getting mated. And black's just going to start checking and give a perpetual. And white's king cannot leave because then the f-pawn will go through. So it's not like white was losing this position or anything. I mean, he would lose if he just ignored black completely and uh, and just pressed along with, like, a5 and h4. And if you let black get this far, then he's going to lose. I mean, here here he gets mated after, like, a6 and g3 check and uh, chop, chop, and king g5, and it's over. Um, so... I don't think white was running any risk of losing unless he just completely ignored black. But the main point was that this tempo was so critical that it just saved him the game. Now, could black have necessarily known and calculated to completion uh, that this game tempo was uh, what turned out to be the decisive error? No. 
But at the same time, if you see a move that gains you a tempo in a racing situation, you play it first and you ask questions later. And basically forcing me to burn a move on king h2 instead of playing g3 gave Black the time he needed to play f4, prevent me from playing g3, and organize very serious checkmating threats that uh, that White couldn't afford to ignore and would instead would have to um, would have to retreat and, and get ready to make a draw against. So. Um, yeah, I thought this was a very instructive endgame. I was glad to win the game, although, of course, uh, it's clear that at this point um, my opponent could have saved the game with rook d2. If he had found this move, it, I think the game would have ended in a draw. Uh, but Or sorry, rook d2, excuse me, rook d2 was lost. If he had found rook d1 and rook b1, I believe the game would have ended in a draw. So to some extent, uh, I was just lucky to win this game because at this point my opponent made a mistake. But in general, if your opponent doesn't make a mistake, you're never going to win a chess game anyway. Still, I think this was a very good point to illustrate that basically at no moment was Black ever pretending that he was going to stop these two pawns here. These guys were going to promote. Uh, but what he could do was slow them down, first by making sure that my rook was not um, able to get out of the way from in front of them, and then while they were slow, be able to make his own counterplay on the king side. And the only way he could have done that fast enough was by gaining this key tempo with rook d1 check and rook b1. So in any case, I, was, I thought this was a very instructive game. Uh, it was featured in my book, Small Steps to Success, which is all about past pawns, along with the first one here. All these key themes you can look at. You can buy from my website, the Quality Chess website, or from the sister company here at uh, Chessable, where I'm typing in the link. Um, in any case, we now have like five minutes left that are unaccounted for. I probably rushed through this game too fast just because the other one took a long time, so I knew I had to speed this one up, but maybe I did that too much. So we have five minutes left, and I would just like to open it up for general question and answer. Uh, just type in your questions. I'll answer whatever uh, whatever you have to ask. To Abdullah uh, Wittenberg, what is the point of going to school for someone who's going to be a chess professional? That's uh, if you know you're going to be a chess professional, maybe there isn't a point. I mean, honestly, I don't think you want to uh, go through life an uneducated human being. I don't want to name any names, but there's like, you know, some chess players out there who just, it seems like they just don't know anything other than chess. You couldn't imagine them ever having a political opinion, voting in an election, driving a car, or, you know, doing any of these other things that uh, a lot of people would call commonplace. Um, so, you, I mean... In general, and you don't have to go to school to become an educated person. You can educate yourself. You can educate yourself on the ways of the world. But another key point is, like, for example, for me, my parents never really had to make a decision about whether to pull me out of school or not just because I started late uh, and I only, like, was one of the best players in the world in my age group by the time I was, like, 17 uh, because I started at 11. And even back in my era in, the, in, like, the early 2000s, when you were 11 years old, you were already a master or you were a nobody. So I was starting with like a 2,200 point deficit. And uh, basically at no moment, um, at no moment would, uh, would I have, um, would it have made sense for them? Like if I was, you know, let's say 14 years old and 2,200 and someone said, oh, would you take your kid out of school like that? No way. Uh, but uh, like, if you look, another way to think about it is like, um, why would you go to school if you know you're going to be a professional basketball player? Well, there's also a possibility you're just not going to make the NBA. And then having an education is something nice to fall back on. In any case, uh, it's, it's a tough thing to balance. I mean, nowadays, I think I'm basically the only top player in the world who went to university. I think MVL may have done some studying in Lausanne, actually. But uh, for the most part, the best players in the world didn't go. But, um, you know, I went. I don't necessarily think it hindered me, but, um, yeah. How much of your preparation is done by engines? In the opening, I can't do any preparation with without an engine. If you just if you analyze without an engine, your your analysis is useless. But your analysis is also useless if you just press the space bar and copy whatever it says. You won't learn to play the resulting middle games very well. And um, you won't learn yeah, you won't learn to play the resulting middle games and uh, and you won't find anything new in the opening because any old person can train a monkey to press a space bar over and over and over again and then figure out and then just memorize. That just doesn't help you. You need to apply your own brain, figure out moments where you disagree with the computer's evaluation, things like that. Um, yeah, okay. Who are you fond of, Navarra? These people say it's um, it's good. Uh, any plans for a third book on pawn play? Not anytime soon. I may write a third book. I'm not sure. 
but I don't think it would necessarily be on pawn play. It's, it's hard. I, I think I've covered that pretty well already. Um, let's see. Do you have a specific time management strategy during classical games? Not really. I think I have a pretty good sense of how to manage my time in general. But one thing I have done is I noticed that there was a phase in my career where I was playing very poorly on my first move out of preparation, often because I was, let's say, I was usually better prepared than my opponents and like walking around while they were thinking. So they're already getting in the zone of playing chess while I'm walking around the room and sort of uh, wasting my time. Uh, then when it's actually time to start playing, I, I had trouble getting in the zone. So at some point I said that I have to spend a minimum of 10 minutes on my first move out of preparation in any given game. And there was some game I got, I forget what it was, someone just gave me like queen b6 check and I had to play king h1 as an only mover. Someone just took one of my pieces and I had to took back. And I still spent the 10 minutes and, uh, and people were looking at me like, what's wrong with you? But uh, I think that rule helps me a lot. But other than that... Um, which candidates tournament are we going to see you in? I don't know. I mean, I'm working hard and trying to be the best chess player I can be. But if this last year has been rather soul crushing, I mean, a lot of things went wrong and, uh, well, things go wrong for everybody at some point in their life. And, you know, what separates the champions from the losers is how they react from it. I did not react well. I played badly anyway, which, you know, a real champ, a true champion would play well, even when things have gone wrong. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to get better and hopefully make the candidate someday. But of course, there's a lot of good players I'm competing with. Um, let's see, anyone else? Uh, time for one more question, maybe. Uh, uh, do I listen to music while studying chess or solving tactics? Um, this is actually kind of funny. Uh, there was one training camp I was at where uh, the person who was in charge of the training camp was constantly playing Green Day. And his rule was that um, as long as the music was playing, you had to be working. And if you uh, if the music turns off, then um, then you you're allowed to be rested. So I've actually started listening to I, I would often listen to Green Day uh, to. Um, to force myself to focus on chess because I just trained myself to whenever that particular music was playing, I, uh, that meant I had to be working. I don't like Green Day. I don't like their band. It's, get, I'm, it's very old by now. And I just, it's funny that I constantly listen to music I don't like as a result. But uh, I actually find that that specific one, for whatever reason, when that goes on, it tells me it's time to work. It's a funny story, but uh, that's why I ended up listening to a band I don't particularly enjoy because of how that one training camp went. In any case, um, in any case, uh, thanks everyone for uh, for this session. It's been um, it's been fun teaching. I don't know when the next one will be, but I hope I can be back sometime. And uh, I'll just for one final time I'll link my uh, link my book down here um, that you can buy on the trustable site, and uh, suggest that you all buy it if you want to look more at these uh, past bond positions. And in any case, uh, until next time, I will uh, see you later. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, Sam. And this is Pascal again. I'll just mention also that. I guess you are coming back tomorrow to play a match against the uh, the uh, team, uh, the Spanish commentary team, and so you will be yeah. back playing for uh, for the English speaking team. So you guys can uh, can see more of Sam tomorrow and playing some blitz games, and it should be uh, hey. good fun. Tenemos que ganar, tenemos que ganar contra estos uh, españoles. There you go. We're gonna. I think this meant essentially we're. We're going to beat the Spanish, I think. So we have to beat the yeah. Spanish guys. Yeah. But I don't know. My Spanish is really, really bad. So is mine. So. Well, th thanks okay. again. This was great fun. And uh, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Let's not okay, just look at openings move by move, but let's try to understand a little something and look at a few typical structures that can arise out of a bunch of main openings. And hopefully, Understanding these structures and the typical plans and the ideas will help you a little bit in your own practice. Laurent, what structures will we cover? So first of all, we will we'll cover um, one very famous structure, uh, Karlsbad structure, which can arise uh, from the Queen's Gambit mainly, but from other openings as well, like uh, the London system or the Karokan. Yes, uh, so, fond childhood memories of the Karlsbad. Thank you. It's important for everyone to understand what's going on here. Then we will have a look at uh, some uh, Rui Lopez, actually, which is a classical line, not the Marshall or the Berlin, but this classical position where white plays d4 and sometimes even uh, goes like uh, with 
is on 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 d5. Uh, even even sometimes taking on c5, we'll see some nice game of uh, Bobby Fischer here and some nice cup of game after d5. Here you will share your Russian upbringing with us. You have all the classical education in the real Lopez. Some nice examples there, hopefully. Then we move on to the French structure, which I don't understand particularly well, but this position has always intrigued me. Who's better and why? What are the plans? Why can white hope for an advantage? Is a space advantage such a big deal? And the French structure can, of course, arise mainly via the French after moves like knight c3, knight d2, or e5, but we also have a small detour into the Caro camp, which is very similar, but not quite the same. I've always been intrigued by this because the bishop can go out here, bishop f5, and it's of course assist times for, for black, but uh, it's not, life is not that simple as we will see. And the last topic uh, will be the symmetrical positions, which kind of hides basically uh, from uh, the border, like the French exchange, French or Petrov, I'm showing right now, or even the Berlin. Berlin rookie one, where we will see an uh, unfinished uh, masterpiece from the current world champion Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, right. Symmetrical positions here, we mean these positions where either side is missing an e pawn that are very common in today's practice. So, this series is not intending to cover every pawn structure imaginable, but we hope we chose some that are instructive and relevant, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. Maybe even once. on Twitter from Damas. Uh, I should not have pronounced that. Uh, that was a bit of a trap, yeah? For those of you who are new to chess, it might look like BA3 is an illegal move here because white advances pawn two squares, not one. But it's a little something we call en passant. And you can do that, but you have to do it instantly. You can't wait for a move, like let's say play king e7, king g2, and now try, because I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is this is too funny for words. This is a software glitch. I'm pretty sure there's not a lot. <laughs> Lawrence, hello, Lawrence. Yeah, I'll play four against Lawrence, and now he's going to play something against me, which we discussed at length uh, during the course of my stay. Yeah, he told me this is excellent. D5. Uh, this was what I was kind of hoping for because now I think he fought his quest. No, Lawrence. This is not how chess works. Sadly, it would be much, much more fun if chess actually worked like this. But I don't think it does. Or maybe it does. Well, that's me regretting what I just said. How did I get from there to here is a little bit beyond me. And what's worse, I will never hear the end of it. Uh, my quality of life has just gone downhill tremendously because I'm actually sharing the office with the guy. 